disrupting everything. So we'll begin with uh, with Douglas Sproul. Would you please introduce yourself and also just uh, confirm your potential conflicts of interest as an employee? <laughs> yeah, it's of, it's uh, it's pretty industry. obvious. So, yes. uh, so good morning. Uh, my name is Doug Sproul. I'm the SMA Therapeutic Area Head at Avexis, and obviously. My clear disclosure is I am an employee of Avexis. Uh, on behalf of Avexis and Novartis, I would like to thank uh, ICER for inviting us to offer our perspective uh, on treatments for SMA type 1. Uh, I'm a board certified pediatric neurologist and neuromuscular specialist. I spent many years caring for patients with SMA type 1 prior to moving over into industry. And I've experienced firsthand the terrible helplessness of making the diagnosis of SMA type 1 without being able to offer any effective treatment options. And, and subsequently seeing these babies inexorably and inevitably deteriorate and die, often within months of the diagnosis, and despite our best efforts. And so we've gone from having no treatments for SMA to an FDA-approved treatment, nucinersin, which is given by chronic intrathecal injections and is a current standard of care for SMA type 1. And we have uh, potentially a potentially life-saving and life-changing gene replacement therapy uh, given as a one-time infusion, Zolgensma is currently under review by the FDA for SMA type 1 as well. So as we talk about the value and the cost-effectiveness of treatments for SMA, let us never lose sight of what matters to provide access to therapies that will save the lives of babies born with the leading genetic cause of infant death. SMA is an ultra-rare disease. In the U.S., there's approximately 25 babies per month that are born with SMA type 1. And an average insurance plan will only see about one or two of these patients per year. In contrast to the well-established natural history of the disease, data from the START trial of Zilgensma has demonstrated a dramatic increase in survival and a transformational improvement in the achievement of motor milestones and motor function. Specifically, all the patients infused with a one-time dose of Zilgensma in that study are alive and without the need of permanent ventilation at 24 months post-dose, the time of study close. As was discussed earlier, no patient in the study received an alternative therapy during the 24-month follow-up interval of the study. 92% of the patients who received the proposed therapeutic dose of this product could sit unassisted, a milestone never achieved in the natural history of SMA type 1. So it's clear that Zilgensma has a potentially transformative clinical outcome that's associated with a profound impact on the lives of infants and their families. Uh, in fact, due to this remarkable evidence, Zilgensma has received breakthrough designation by the FDA and the equivalent designations in, United, in Europe and Japan, and this is unprecedented. Uh, to date, more than 125 patients have been treated with Zilgensma. ICER's analysis found Zilgensma to be cost-effective uh, up to $5 million at the ultra-rare disease threshold of $500,000 per quality, uh, and up to $7 million using the life years gain when compared with best supportive care. Multiple experts, including NICE, CuraSMA, and even ICER itself, have acknowledged the need for higher than standard thresholds for ultra-rare diseases. Uh, and ICER has also acknowledged that current cost-effectiveness models are insufficient to evaluate one-time potentially curative treatments. And that's why we feel strongly that traditional measures are not adequate uh, for the evaluation of rare disease, particularly ultra-rare disease treatments, uh, particularly and especially those that are, are delivered as a single administration. Nucinosin is indisputably the current standard of care for SMA type 1 in the United States, and therefore the most appropriate comparison for any analysis uh, is Zolgensma monotherapy compared with Nucinosin, uh, as opposed to a comparison, let's be honest, with nothing, which is the current, which is the best supportive care as described in the model. Instead of direct comparison, ICER conducted extensive Zolgensma followed by Nucinosin or combination scenarios. Uh, which are unfortunately mislabeled as Zilgensma in the report. While we appreciate the interest in the potential of combining both products, to date there have been no studies to, to demonstrate or determine the safety and efficacy of combination therapy. The chronic treatment of ultra-rare disease can cost the healthcare system tens of millions of dollars over a lifetime of a patient. At Avexis, we're challenging this treatment paradigm with the introduction of a one-time of one-time potentially curative gene therapies. We're exploring innovative models, including risk sharing agreements and pay over time options for payers, uh, and exploring meaningful ways to enable and ensure access and affordability for families. And we encourage ICER to continue to look for better ways to recognize and quantify the value and potential.
potential lifetime benefits that groundbreaking gene therapies like Zolgensma could provide to families affected by SMA and other rare diseases. Thank you, and I'll pass the podium. Thank you. Uh, now we have Dr. Young from Biogen. No? Can I respond? Sure. In a way, it's just because there were a couple of statements made about what ICER acknowledges um, that I just need to put into some context. I'm going to stand up. So, um, first, we do not acknowledge that, oops, that cost effectiveness, I guess, or that the broader approach that we take in our reports are inadequate for one time treatments. Uh, for instance, our, the last time we looked at something like this would be CAR-T, I guess, is one analog, a one-time treatment for a rapidly fatal condition for infants. And we found that at the list price, it was well within the, the standard cost-effectiveness ranges. So it's not, we do not believe that it is a standard belief that we hold or that many others hold that it's not appropriate. And I think that HTA organizations around the world would, would agree, and I, I think that you're working with all of them pretty much under the same parameters. Now, we do have specific language around the threshold because, again, we do not acknowledge that a higher threshold, the 500,000 per quality, is the right threshold to use for treatments of ultra-rare disorders. After a long process of, of discussion with m many different stakeholders, patient groups, and others, our approach has been to say the following. We note that for treatments of ultra-rare disorders, decision makers in the United States and in international settings often give special weighting to other benefits and to contextual considerations that lead to coverage and funding decisions at higher prices and thus higher cost-effectiveness ratios than those applied to decisions about other treatments. So that's what we say. There's a historical pattern and we provide information in a broader range, but we do not intend to convey that 500,000, which is the top range that we provide in our report, should be viewed as the normative threshold. So we're very careful not to say that. And our own value-based price benchmarks are retained at the 100 to $150,000 range that we use for, for other products. So I just wanted to, to clarify and just to make sure that there wasn't a misunderstanding about what ICER acknowledges. Any other uh, questions or comments from the CPAC panel? Okay, now we'll move to Dr. Yang from right. Biogen. And you can tell us you're from Biogen. <laughs> yes, no, thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for the opportunity to speak to the CPAC panel here this morning. I'd like to echo um, Dr. Pearson's comments earlier today and acknowledge the heroics of the SMA community who we've had the privilege to work with over several years, including especially Danielle and Brandy. And I haven't seen you guys for a couple of years, but uh, thank you for everything you've done. So as I said, I'm Jonathan Yong. I'm head of the neuromuscular therapy area team at the medical group uh, at Biogen. Um, and uh, we are essentially a world leader in the neurosciences space. We've had the privilege to work with the SMA community and have learned a great deal by working with patient advocates, carers, um, and healthcare providers. It has been a privilege to serve in that space. In our years of work, we've learned some critical lessons. Firstly among these is the importance of early treatment. And I think some of this is highlighted in the nurture data which was presented today. Keep in mind that all patients receiving Spinraza are currently able to sit unsupported who receive it in the nurture study. In addition to that, the vast majority are able to walk with assistance or independently who are receiving Spinraza. The second thing is that we've, what's come along this journey is that it's become evidently clear that the outcomes that may be most important to patients, such as those which are improvements in stamina, the improvements in fatigue, um, and the ability to maintain or regain critical aspects of independent function in life are the most challenging to quantify in cost-effective analyses, and I think these have been acknowledged. For adults with SMA, as examples, the ability to speak in full sentences, to maintain limb or hand functions, which would thus enable mobility, self-care, independence, education, and careers, are often intangible benefits that only patients highly value. In ICE's assessments, these improvements have been assigned either low value or no value at all. Given our learnings and the available evidence generated to date, we believe it is inappropriate for the CPAC to not take these additional considerations into account in a meaningful manner when assessing the clinical and economic evidence for Spinraza. Furthermore, Biogen would like to highlight three additional particular areas of concern that we urge this panel to consider. Firstly, ICE's evaluation of Spinraza 
and Zolgensma data set does not take into account adequately the substantial differences between available data between the programs. ISA does not make a sufficient effort to adjust for these differences or differences around the certainty of this data. We are, as a community, excited at the prospect of new and innovative therapies, and we welcome the day when there are multiple treatment options for these patients and families. In particular, as previously highlighted, the AVXS 101 Zolgensma data set is limited in the extreme, a single arm, open label, single site study comprising of 12 to 15 patients. This is in stark comparison to the data set supporting Spinraza, where over 300 patients are involved in clinical trials with up to six years of follow-up, including randomized large controlled studies. To date, over 6,600 patients globally have received Spinraza therapy in the real world setting. It is quite simply too early to evaluate the long-term value of Avexis based on the data available today. ISA's approach unintentionally incentivizes manufacturers to generate less robust data sets for submission. In assigning similar ratings to these two therapies, ISA has failed to acknowledge the robustness of Spinraza's data package. Secondly, we believe that ISA may be underestimating the long-term costs of treating patients with Zolgensma. As previously highlighted, clearly a significant proportion of patients either receive or seek to receive and potentially benefit from combination therapies. Finally, the ISA report contrasts sharply with outcomes of multiple HTA assessments globally. The ISA evaluation has failed to capture the real-world value experienced by patients around the world especially in the later onset population. ISA's qualities for Spinraza in later onset patients differ drastically. The example previously raised by Dr. Stevenson and colleagues uh, in the Swedish study, for example, highlights an incremental quality gain of 9.54 for Spinraza versus best supportive care. The ISA's report has an incremental quality gain of less than one. We believe that in a severe, rare disease such as SMA, it is the patients, caregivers, um, and providers who ultimately are the true voice of value. We strongly urge this panel to carefully consider the broad evidence base, including nurture and emerging evidence in the later onset population, when taking a vote on a medicine that provides life-saving and life-enhancing therapies. We thank you for your kind consideration and welcome your questions. Thank you very much for your comments. I'd like to ask if the uh, CPAC ICER staff uh, have any Thanks. comments? Um, I, I did want to comment um, because we spent a lot of time uh, thinking about evidence and evidence ratings and indeed the issue of encouraging companies to do really good trials. And there's a dramatic difference between the evidence base for these two therapies and the quality of the two trials. I mean, Biogen, despite this being an ultra rare disease conducted, uh, two randomized trials uh, with sham controls at a two to one um, ratio. Uh, the, you know, exactly the sort of evidence you'd want and did great work on this. Um, and the evidence on Zolgensma is 15 patients, 12 that got the dose that you all are evaluating. And yet, uh, the ICER evidence matrix uh, within that, we gave both drugs an A rating. The ICER evidence matrix says, how sure are you that there is a substantial benefit to this therapy compared to the thing that you're comparing it to? How sure are you that if you get Spinraza <coughs> versus best supportive care, you would experience a substantial benefit? Well, that's not a hard one with the randomized trials. Then you have 12 patients. We know what the natural history of type 1 SMA is. These babies never sit. After a couple of years, they don't move. They're ventilated or they die, and then they die. That isn't what happened in those 12 patients over two years. Do we know what will happen in the long term with either drug? No. But even if that only happened with what happened with Zolgensma, for two years, and then these patients rapidly deteriorated, we felt that patients, families, clinicians would say that is a substantial benefit. 
And so we're sure the drug has a substantial benefit. We have now in our report a fairly long description of why giving both of these drugs an A rating doesn't mean we think that we have equal evidence for the two drugs or that we have equal certainty in the boundaries of what that benefit looks like. But we're sure both drugs in type 1 SMA provide substantial benefit. Uh, only briefly, um, it is hard to know. I've, I've obviously listed some, I think they're on page 87, 88 of the report, what NICE did say. But in terms of the later group, we had a model from Biogen that did give a survival advantage in the type 2, type 3. The second model didn't, and that, and that was when we were doing our model. We were looking at the latest evidence that had come. It's now been reverted in the third, but I think the numbers that are being talked about are from the first, uh, what was called an appraisal consultation document from NICE. The second one wasn't released because there was going to be price negotiations. So um, that's still where it is, but they, the reports that were discussed publicly yesterday show there's a lot of... Uh, a lot of uncertainty, and even in the models we've been given, it's changed their mind a couple of times. Any questions from members of the CPAC panel? Or from our clinical experts or patient representatives? Seeing none, I'll invite Steve Pearson then to uh, conduct a brief roundtable. Go ahead to the to the public comment. Okay, and we will move to public comment. So I'm going to ask our, our public commenters to come to the main session table. I do believe we have space. Uh, that would be Crystal Davis, uh, Mary Schroth, and Kristen Stevenson. So I'd like to ask Crystal Davis to begin, uh, if you could introduce yourself and disclose any conflicts of interest. And I would ask all commenters to observe, we have, do have a timer, we're, we're working off our schedule. We have, we're, we're doing well, but we're asking you to maintain uh, your remarks or contain them within that five minute time frame. I'm Crystal K. Davis. I'm an SMA patient, caregiver, and patient advocate. I've participated on advisory committees and I advocate for access to rare disease treatments. I have no qualifying um, conflicts. Our newborn son, Hunter, lost nearly all movement at two weeks of age. We didn't know what was happening. At one point, my husband asked if I had shaken Hunter. I could never hurt our baby, but he was hurting. The coming days and weeks led to more heartache and questions, but no answers. On September 30, 2011, our world changed forever. Doctors diagnosed our eight-week-old baby with SMA type 1. They told us Hunter would continue to lose what movement remained, as well as the abilities to swallow and breathe. They then instructed us to take Hunter home and enjoy what time we had left with him, expected to be between three and six months. Absent treatment, SMA is a relentless disease that continues to take until it robs the very last breath. Prior to Hunter starting treatments under the Expanded Access Program, he had lengthy and expensive hospital stays in the PICU. In addition to the cost of these services, the stays took an emotional toll on our family and caused me to miss significant amounts of time with our other children. One stay resulted from Hunter going into respiratory failure, despite my best efforts as a veteran SMA mom. An ambulance took us to the hospital and doctors emergently intubated Hunter. At the time, my husband Curtis was in India on a business development trip. Curtis is a co-founder and chief operating officer of a tech startup. He also leads business development. Curtis cut his trip short, flying home to be with Hunter and me during the medical crisis. His missing business opportunities and work impacted the company, its employees, and their families. The quality measure fails to capture any of these significant economic impacts. Since beginning Spinraza in 2016, Hunter has not been hospitalized. The cost of this treatment is frequently criticized and concerns are raised about the impact on insurance companies. We've seen little impact relating to Hunter's treatment on our insurance. 
Each year since Hunter began treatment, Under continued to receive 80-20 roll letters and returned premiums. This is a small company with 46 insured employees and 40 insured dependents. SMA patients continue to struggle accessing treatment. The FDA approved Spinraza for pediatric and adult SMA patients. It did not carve out portions of the SMA population recognizing the unmet need. Insurance policies routinely fail to cover the weakest patients desperately needing treatment. We cannot exclude weak patients from trials to obtain robust data and deny those patients access due to lack of data for their segment of the patient population. We must strive to ensure equity of access to SMA and other rare disease treatments. Increases in healthcare spending related to medical services continue to outpace increases for pharmaceutical products despite innovative therapies approved for rare diseases with unmet needs. Rare disease patients are provided access to medical services to treat acute medical situations caused by their diseases, such as respiratory failure for SMA. However, patients have a much harder time accessing approved treatments to maintain their baseline health to avoid acute medical crises. We need to change this access conundrum. Hunter's treatments allowing him to maintain his baseline health have been instrumental in avoiding lengthy hospital stays. Spinraza and gene replacement therapy treatments work best when provided presymptomatically. Most babies and children continue to be treated following the onset of symptoms, greatly diminishing their chance at achieving an average childhood. Presymptomatic diagnosis and treatment will allow SMA babies the opportunity to run, walk, and play freely with their friends instead of being tethered to life-saving equipment that monitors, feeds, and breathes for them like our son, Hunter. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Uh, now I'd like to introduce Mary Schroth, and if you could just speak to any conflicts that you might have. Um, I am the Chief Medical Officer for Cure SMA, and we receive more than 25% of our funding from uh, industry. Um, uh, my name is uh, Dr. Mary Schroth, uh, and I'm here on behalf of Cure SMA and the SMA community. At Cure SMA, we advocate for the patient voice to be included and to be the primary factor in decisions about treatment and care. We believe each individual and family should be able to choose for themselves the treatment that best fits their unique goals, needs, and challenges. SMA is caused by a gene mutation in the survivor motor neuron 1 gene, SMN1, and is modulated by the backup gene, SMN2. This gene mutation modulation occurs in all phenotypes of SMA, and thus each evaluated therapy's mechanism of action is the same across the disease spectrum, thus facilitating general, generalizability. As a response to the current version of the ISO report, we note the following five concerns. One, non-sitting survival. The assumptions used for the non-sitting health status modeling are flawed. The model has incorrectly given lesser outcomes to the treated and improved non-sitting group that were associated with a completely different natural history group. The survival rate for this treated non-sitting group has now been increased to the current uh, report version. It has been increased in the current report version to be the same as for permanent ventilation. However, this is still not accurate. ICER should increase the survival rates of this treated and interim milestone attaining an improved non-sitter group to be positioned between permanent ventilation and sitters. Also, whether the treated non-sitter will achieve milestones after 24 months with continued treatment is an uncertainty. The model is unnecessarily pessimistic and does not take into consideration the possibility of further gains in the treated non-sitter health status. We challenge these assumptions and submit that the non-sitter life years are underestimated. The potential for future motor milestone gains should be further considered in the current models. Number two, later onset survival. Similar to the above, the interim milestone achieving and approved group of later onset patients should also be given a longer lifespan than the untreated in the models. Number three, quality. The ICER analysis focuses and provides headlines on a benchmark of $150,000 per quality. While this may be appropriate in non-rare conditions, it may not reflect the unique challenges and opportunities associated with an ultra-rare condition like SMA, as stated by ICER itself. Limiting conclusions to the $150,000 level may not take into consideration the severity of the disease and the impact of new therapies on the disease natural history. Per the recent ICER white paper titled Value Assessment Framework for Ultra-Rare Diseases, page four, I quote, first, as expressed in the ICER white paper, there are two major reasons given for altering the assessment of value of orphan drugs compared to other treatments. 
One, small patient numbers make it very hard to conduct the types of studies that would usually be required to demonstrate with the same level of certainty the safety, effectiveness, and comparative effectiveness of an emerging drug. And two, small patient numbers may make it impossible to recoup developmental costs unless prices exceed those that would be commensurate with traditional cost effectiveness thresholds, end quote. For SMA, the benchmark of $500,000 per quality should be highlighted and shown in conclusions and all public statements. Based on the comments provided earlier, we request clarity in the report. In addition, as acknowledged by ICER, the life year's impact should also be utilized to avoid the discriminatory aspects of quality. ICER should also highlight these life years impacts in all conclusions and public statements. Number four, discounting life years. For a pediatric and typically fatal disease such as SMA that now has transformative and impactful treatments, and these treatments have the potential to extend life from two up to 30 and even 60 years, the ICER model financially discounting life years has a significant effect. Due to the transformative impact of these therapies on this fatal pediatric disease, we submit that a scenario should be shown and highlighted where life years are not discounted at all. Number five, clinical trials. The ICER evaluation is quick to cite controversies in the clinical data when in fact these are not controversies, but the usual future uncertainties which are typical from all clinical trials. We encourage ICER to avoid creating and bringing controversies into the collaborative SMA community. As with all clinical trials, there's ongoing uncertainty about longer term outcomes. These are important issues that would ideally be examined using real world data on drug efficacy and safety. We believe ICER should frame long-term uncertainties in a more balanced manner, giving equal possibilities of both pessimistic and optimistic scenarios for future results. The number of positive scenarios modeled are greatly limited compared to the pessimistic and conservative models. We would also request more information and background on all the clinical experts and their expertise in history in the SMA field, whose opinions are frequently mentioned in the report so that we may further comment. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Dr. Schroep, for those comments. Just want to ask if there's a response from the ICER staff. Um, yeah, I mean, when we don't have the data, you can have alternative plausible um, thoughts on it. So we're not sure who's right at the minute, so we can disagree on it. But one thing that would be clear that maybe isn't coming through or isn't intuitive is if we extend the life of the patients who aren't sitting, the ICER will go up. So this, you may think that the ICER will go down because the patient's actually doing better, but the fact that they're living in a state that has this high monthly cost, even if we increase the utility a bit to take, in advance, uh, take into account the things you've said, the ISA will increase. So it's not obvious, so I wanted to make that clear to the committee. But hopefully we're trying to be realistic where we're saying that was our best view, but others do exist, so. This may sound like I'm pandering, but I'm really not. Thank you for bringing the amount of sophistication blended with grounding and the patient experience that you did throughout the process for our team. It was just really, really important. And I know that at the end, there may be some differences on some of the technical aspects, but the fact that, I mean, we've really, really appreciated the fact that you have engaged with us around some of those. You know, discounting is a tough one because it's, it, it is handled slightly differently around the world and it's an evolving area of health economics. And we are following the current standards set by the second panel in the United States, but it's something that we are going to be evaluating further as our work goes forward. So I'm glad you highlighted that as one issue. Um, and we have, I hope you, you, you commented on it as a, as a concern, but I hope you have noticed the highlight that we have brought to the life year gained as part of the, it was in the press release, it's in the executive summary, so it's, it, it's always been in our reports, but we are absolutely trying to make sure that we provide as broad a perspective on cost effectiveness so that policymakers can appreciate when that does make some difference and why. So if, if you think there's further messaging around that that we can do better, that's another thing that we can continue to learn from you as this uh, process continues. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, now I'd like to introduce Kristen Stevenson, uh, or I ask you to introduce yourself and then disclose any conflicts that you might have. Sure. Thank you. My name is Kristen Stevenson, and I serve as the Chief Policy and Community Engagement Officer for the Muscular Dystrophy Association. Um, and, uh, and as with other patient advocacy organizations, we also do receive funding from industry, including those who are being discussed in the current report. 
Uh, I want to thank you all for having us here and for opening up this dialogue and for giving us all a seat at the table to participate in the conversation. I think it's a really important discussion to have um, and certainly appreciate that you are opening this up early um, and taking into account uh, a broad range of perspectives and giving us multiple opportunities <coughs> to weigh in. You've heard a lot this morning about this is a really pivotal time in the SMA community and it really can't be overstated. We went just from a couple of years ago to having no disease modifying options to now looking at having uh, potential options within the calendar year um, and including a, a novel gene therapy approach. And so it's really a very exciting time and I think that it is an opportunity for this community to also kind of set a precedent for how these kinds of uh, developments can be handled in other disorders. Um, the Muscular Dystrophy Association is an umbrella organization, so we're very keen on following ISER's work in additional disorders as well um, that fall under our umbrella, and so we're looking at this from the perspective of not only SMA, but also um, the rare and ultra-rare disease kind of neuromuscular community um, at large. And I think that having a value framework is very important. It's something that we certainly support and appreciate the, the impact of. And especially as we think about how a value uh, framework will impact the community and the decision makers in the space, we're also looking very much at how payers will rely on this kind of information and how they will be um, taking this into account when making decisions that will ultimately determine whether um, individuals uh, can have access to therapies that are life-changing and life-saving. And so what we would want to make sure in our comments, and you'll hear a lot of the same themes that you've heard um, in the other comments uh, similar to ours, which is just making sure that the patient perspectives in terms of milestones and impact are being taken into consideration to the greatest extent possible when determining um, efficacy and when determining the value proposition as a whole. And thinking of beyond uh, maybe sitting and standing and walking and thinking about some of the other things you have heard about today and that you saw reflected in the various comments that were submitted, being able to feed oneself, being able to participate in activity outside the home. Um, and, and, you know, today the presentation by Dr. Pearson was started out with uh, comments from the patient perspective. And so I know that that's important to ICER. It's top of mind, but thinking about how we can incorporate that to the greatest extent possible into um, the, the value framework analysis itself. I think another area that we would um, urge uh, the group to consider is there's been a lot of discussion about uncertainty today, which I think is very honest and reflective of the early stage um, analysis that's happening right now. But to the extent that there is uncertainty, making sure that that uncertainty is called out very clearly so that um, it, is, it is known to those who would rely upon the findings of any one of these reports that there are some real uncertainties um, that are built in and that this is the best thinking based on what is known, but that everything isn't known at this point. And I appreciate that this room understands that. But as uh, these findings and as these learnings are being projected out to the broader community, the appreciation for the amount of uncertainty around some of the findings may not be as obvious without having them called out specifically. Um, and then I would like to just um, conclude by saying we would also agree with Dr. Schroth's comments on um, really thinking about the quality that's being used um, and applied and making sure that it is um, the maximum that it should be to accurately reflect what the value framework um, needs to do and also with regard to um, the life year analysis and making sure that again a very close lens is being put on that in light of this being a, a very rare um, and devastating disorder. So thank you again for your time and we appreciate being here. Thank you very much for your comments. Uh, any uh, thoughts or responses from members of the CPAC panel, ICER staff, or our clinical or patient uh, representatives? Yes. I just uh, particularly want to thank the patient and family representatives. Uh, I know we're having a very technical discussion about something that's deeply personal and in some cases deeply painful. So your attendance, your, in my view, courage is deeply appreciated. I don't want to be repetitive, but this is worth, I think, worth saying and related to some of the stuff that Kristen was just saying is that um, so many people do so much work to get ready for these meetings and you can see, um, but I, I just, um, and I always find the patient perspective so helpful and informative, but I, I, I guess I just um, want to call out some of the contributions um, just because it, 
especially in this particular disease condition, you know, I, I don't think any of our parents could imagine um, that the kind of thing, a diagnosis like this or a death of a child is a kind of the thing you fear the most in life. And I just can only imagine how much courage it takes for you guys to come here and all, all of you. And, and I think that I just want you to know so deeply how this informs our work here, that it really informs it tremendously. And it's, it's such a um, wonderful legacy to your, to your kids as well, because you're going to help um, the, the community at large. So, so thank you.